Formation of hemiacetals and acetals is going to be the topic of this lesson, and this involves the addition of alcohols, now our second oxygen nucleophile here to ketones and aldehydes. And uh, it can be base catalyzed, it can be acid catalyzed. We'll go through the mechanisms of both. Uh, we'll see some biological relevance. We'll see that glucose uh, in the body often forms a cyclic hemiacetal. And then we'll also look at the formation of a cyclic acetal using ethylene glycol to serve as what we call a protecting group for ketones and aldehydes as well. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these weekly throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so we take a look at this and we'll start with base catalyzed uh, formation of a hemiacetal. And in this case, uh, with being base catalyzed, you're, it's not just you add like an alcohol with base, you add an alcohol with its specific conjugate base. So if this was methanol, this would be methoxide, like sodium methoxide. If this was ethanol, this would be like sodium ethoxide. So the corresponding alkoxide is gonna be the base specifically that we add. And in this case, your alkoxides are very strong nucleophiles, just like hydroxide was. And with strong nucleophiles, you can attack your ketone or aldehyde carbonyl carbon directly. And so that's what we're gonna do first step here. We're just gonna do nucleophilic attack, push the pi electrons up to the oxygen. So and in this case, we've now formed an alkoxide here as well, and we're just gonna protonate it using our corresponding alcohol. Reversible all the way through, just like it was for hydration. So, and now we've added the alkoxide here to what was used to be the carbonyl carbon on one side of that double bond, and then protonated the oxygen on the other side of that double bond. And this is what we call a hemiacetal. You might also hear people pronounce it hemiacetal. Take your pick. All right, so you can recognize a hemiacetal because you've got a carbon with bonds to two different oxygen atoms. One is an OR and one is an OH. That's a hemiacetal. And hemi kind of means like halfway. And so we're, and it turns out it's a very good name because we're halfway to forming what's called an acetal. Now under base catalyzed conditions, this is as far as you can go, but we'll find out we can continue on when we do this under acid catalyzed conditions. And so to do the reaction under acid catalyzed conditions, along with your alcohol, instead of adding an, an alkoxide base here, you're just gonna add an acid. And here I'm just gonna put generically H plus, but you might see like sulfuric acid, pretty common and stuff like this. And uh, just like when you put a strong acid like sulfuric acid in water and it, you know, causes it dissociates completely to form protonated water. Well, here it's going to dissociate completely in our alcohol to form a protonated alcohol. So and just analogous to like H3O plus where one of the H's is now a carbon chain of your alcohol. And so it turns out we're drawing that in because that's the actual acidic species that's going to react here. And again, your alcohol like water, not a good nucleophile. And poor nucleophiles cannot attack that carbonyl carbon directly with any significant... Uh, uh, prevalence. And so what we've got to do is protonate our ketone first, just like we saw with hydrate formation. And so we'll protonate that oxygen, making this a much stronger electrophile. And so now this carbon's got a significant amount of more partial positive charge. And now even a weak nucleophile like an alcohol can come and do nucleophilic attack. Again, reversible all the way across here. So in this case, just like we saw with hydration, when we had water attacking, when you've got a neutral nucleophile attacking, you end up with a positive formal charge and it's gonna get deprotonated by whoever your solvent is. In this case, our solvent's not water, it's the alcohol. And so we'll just draw in another equivalent of the alcohol. Now we'll come and deprotonate. I was getting ahead of myself a little bit there. All right, so once again, we formed a hemiacetal. That carbon's bonded to an OR and an OH, So, but we're not done. So we can take this further and we can do this under acidic conditions, whereas we couldn't do this under basic conditions. And back in the alcohol chapter, you guys learned that the OH is a poor leaving group, and it's still true. 
So, however, you also learned that you can protonate it under acidic conditions and turn it into a good leaving group, aka water, which is exactly what we're going to do here. And so, in this case, we're going to take this hydroxyl group and we'll take the uh, protonated alcohol we just formed. And once again, he's our acid. And so we'll protonate our hemiacetal. And now we've got a good leaving group, and we also formed an equivalent of our alcohol. And once you've got your good leaving group, then have it leave. And that's exactly what we're going to do, is we're going to have this leave. And it looks like we're about to form a carbocation, but the truth is we're going to form a resonant stabilized carbocation, because it'll end up on a carbon right next to an atom that has lone pairs. Now sometimes you'll see this drawn and they'll draw both resonant structures, but really commonly and probably more commonly done this way is they're only going to show the major resonant structure and they'll show the arrow pushing to show how it forms where we form that carbon oxygen double bond right there. And so once again reversible all the way through and so we've got this lovely so cation here, and again, with a carbon oxygen double bond where the oxygen's got a positive formal charge, that's analogous to what we had right back here with a carbon oxygen double bond with the oxygen with a positive formal charge, and that carbonyl carbon is super electrophilic. And so same kind of thing here. Sometimes again, you'll see this drawn and you'll see the other corresponding resonant structure as well, which I'll just kind of draw in off to the side here. And the other one looking more like a carbocation. So that positive charge is really shared between both the carbon and the oxygen. But again, evidence we've got a significant amount of partial positive charge. And uh, the, another equivalent of the alcohol can now come in and attack. And once again, when a neutral nucleophile attacks, it ends up with a positive formal charge and we'll just deprotonate it again as well. So we'll bring in another equivalent of alcohol to deprotonate. Cool. And now this guy here is what we refer to as an acetal. Cool. And this acetal, you can recognize it because again, you've got a carbon bonded to two different oxygens and neither one's an OH. They're both OR groups. So it kind of looks like a geminal diether, but this is not an ether. It's not a diether. It reacts very differently than an ether. So this is an acetal. And so we've got the hemiacetal here and here. So, but again, with excess alcohol under acidic conditions, you can go all the way to forming this acetal as well. And this process is reversible all the way through. So, and it turns out with it being reversible all the way through, you can actually get it and shift the equilibrium all the way back. And so it turns out, where did we have this? And I never drew it in, but we had formation of water here. And so before we erase this mechanism, just want to point out that we did form some water. And so I'm going to go back and rewrite this here with some balanced reactions and we'll see how to take advantage of this reversibility here. So, but this is your common under acidic conditions. You're going to find that the mechanisms are much worse than the base catalyzed mechanisms. And in this case, you'll see that this is like six steps and that's going to be pretty typical. In fact, this might be more than six steps in this example, um, but that's going to be pretty typical. And what you're going to find is that uh, if you want something to leave and it's not a good leaving group, well then protonate it. So if you've got a good leaving group, have it leave. And so we notice we did that here. We had an OH and it was, wasn't a good leaving group. So what did we do? We protonated it. And then we had it leave as soon as it was a good leaving group. So you're going to find these kind of patterns pretty common throughout this chapter, as well as the carboxylic acid derivatives chapter in the future when we're dealing with acid catalysis and the mechanisms get ugly and they get messy. So, but if you can remember one big thing here, if you want something to leave to get to your desired product and it's not a good leaving group, then protonate it. Probably what you're doing along the way. All right. So let's go back and summarize this a little bit uh, now that we've covered the mechanism. All right, so let's go back and take a look at the general reactions here. And 
Again, so formation of a hemiacetal under base catalyzed conditions, and once you form that hemiacetal, it can go no further. But under acid catalyzed conditions, you add one equivalent of your alcohol, you form the hemiacetal. So, but again, you can protonate that OH and have it leave under acidic conditions, and adding a second equivalent of the alcohol gets you to an acetal. Now, a couple things about this. Notice we also formed water as a byproduct in this reaction, and it turns out this is reversible in, in both directions. If you add excess alcohol with acid, you shift the equilibrium towards the acetal, according to Le Chatelier's principle. But if you add excess water with acid, you'll shift the equilibrium back towards the ketone and the separate alcohols instead. And so notice we said that if you add water with acid, and you should think of water with acid as H3O plus. And so oftentimes you'll see this presented in two different directions. If you start with the acetal and add H3O plus, you can convert it right back into a ketone and two equivalents of the corresponding alcohol. And so sometimes you'll get tested on showing the reversibility of this. And you might be on the hook for the mechanism and it's exactly the reverse of the mechanism for the forward reaction. So, but more commonly is you might be on the hook for predicting products and starting with an acetal, adding H3O plus, and then being able to predict both the ketone and the alcohols. And it doesn't seem that bad, but when you start getting like some cyclic structures, it gets to be a pain in the butt. We'll also learn that forming acetal, so it turns out for a typical ketone, uh, the equilibrium constant for acetal formation is not great, and for an aldehyde, it's only okay. So, however, we'll learn one trick that if we use instead of two equivalents of an alcohol to get your acetal, if you end up using a cyclic diol, I'm sorry, if we use a diol, we'll form a cyclic acetal instead, and we'll use that as a protecting group uh, with some unique applications for retrosynthesis, as we'll see here in a little bit. Before we get there, though, I did want to talk about so, uh, some biological relevance, and this is D-glucose right here, so super common sugar in your body. Uh, most common one we look at the uh, metabolism of in a biochemistry class and stuff like this. And it turns out this is the linear form represented with a Fischer projection. So, but it turns out in solution, whether it be a little bit acidic or basic, it often cyclizes forming a hemiacetal. And so it turns out the most common example of this is where you get nucleus. So we'll probably protonate this uh, or deprotonate this depending on the acidic or base conditions. But one way, shape or form, we're going to get nucleophilic attack from this oxygen right here, pushing these electrons up to that oxygen. And so when you add an alcohol to a ketone or aldehyde, aldehyde in this case, you're going to form a hemiacetal. And eventually this oxygen is going to get protonated, and this one's going to get deprotonated, and it might happen before or after, depending on the conditions. I'm not super worried about the, the exact mechanism, but I do want to show what this looks like once it's cyclized here. So we're gonna end up forming a six-membered ring, and one of the members of that ring is this oxygen right here, and then you've got these five carbons as part of that ring as well. And if we number this around, this would be carbon number one, two, three, four, and five. So, and then we'll have a six carbon attached to carbon number five. So this carbon right up here that used to be a carbonyl is now gonna be carbon number one right here. So, and then we've got carbon two, and it turns out an OH on the right is gonna point down. Not super important now, but important in your biochemistry class when you get there. So OH on the left is going to point up. OH on the right is going to point down. And then this OH is no longer an OH. It's the O that's in the ring right there. And then your CH2OH off carbon six is right here. Now it turns out that the oxygen that used to be part of the aldehyde, once we do nucleophilic attack, it will get protonated and be an OH. Now here it's an sp2 hybridized carbon, but here it's going to be sp3. And so it turns out that OH could point up or down depending on the, how the cyclization reaction happens. And so it turns out when it points down, it turns out uh, because this could uh, uh, form two, you know, one of two different chiral centers, we call it the anomeric carbon. And again, not important for now, will be important in biochem. So I'm just alluding to the future here. So but when it points down, it turns out we call it beta, and when it points up, I'm sorry, when it points down, we call it alpha for a D sugar, and when it points up, we call it beta for a D sugar. Uh, and so if these are ringing a bell, that's kind of there. So I'm just wanting to hint to the future, so to show that this really is a hemiacetal, where you've got a carbon that's bonded to two oxygens, so this one here, and then he's bonded, I'm sorry, it's this carbon, my bad, bonded to two oxygens. One's not an OH, one is an OH, so an OH and an OR, if you will, and that's a hemiacetal. And there's your relevance for biochemistry. So finally, we want to look at one last thing here. We want to look at the hydrolysis of acetals. And we said you can form an acetal, but it's reversible. If you add H3O+, plus, you go back to being a ketone or aldehyde. And so sometimes this is presented in the reverse reaction context where you're, you start off with that acetal, 
It doesn't have to be a cyclic one, but I'm going to use a cyclic one because that's usually the most confusing examples. So, but you start off with the acetal, and again, the way you recognize you got that acetal is you've got a single carbon bonded to two oxygens, neither of which is an OH. And if you add H3O plus here, it'll convert it back to the ketone. And you've got to be able to predict products. And sometimes when they make these cyclic, the hardest time it is to predict products. And so what I recommend you do here, we already know where this came from. If you recall, we formed this earlier when we added. So these ethylene glycol with an acid catalyst to our ketone. And so that should be our products if we add H3O plus to reverse the reaction. But now I want to show you just a different way to approach predicting the product. And what I want you to do with your acetal is just redraw it as your product and draw it nice and big. Like so. And then where you've got your two carbon oxygen single bonds, go ahead and erase those. And then you're going to add your water back in. So H2O. And notice there's our products. So first of all, you should realize that hydrolysis means the destruction or splitting of water. So I should actually say lysis is the destruction splitting, hydro water. So it's just a reaction where water is consumed as a reactant. So what we're doing is we're just adding water back into our product. And there's the two H's and the O of the water we added back in. And so again, the key is just go back and erase your two carbon oxygen single bonds. The carbon that had two single bonds at oxygens now has a double bond to a single oxygen. It's a ketone or aldehyde. So, and then add your two hydrogens back in so that these go back to being alcohols. And whether this had been cyclic or not, this pre you know, predictive way of, of predicting the hydrolysis products will work every time. So, and some of you may be on the hook for this, some of you may not. So, but this is something that the students that are on the hook struggle with immensely. So I just want to take a second to cover it here. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best things you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for ketone and aldehyde practice problems, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.